predicted this man's name. His name occurs frequently in the society of Israel. The origin of the name is Hebrew, and it's the Hebrew word Judah, or Judah, the tribe of Judah. And it, interestingly enough, the word Judah means to give thanks, to praise. And so here is a man who is called as a disciple, who is given by his parents the name praise and to give thanks. And unfortunately, the, name, the actions of this man did anything but give thanks and praise to God. Now, this is a common name. It's sort of like Smith in the, in the English language. In the Old Testament, one of Jacob's sons was a Judas. The half-brother Jesus was named Judas. The, another of the twelve, Judas Labaius, was named Judas. Uh, a Galilean zealot named Judas started the revolution in A.D. 6. Um, a man the apostle Paul stayed with on the road named Strait was named Judas. Uh, a member of the delegation that came from Antioch, Assyria, uh, was named Judas Barsabbas. And then seventhly, there was Judas the betrayer. Nothing stood out about the name of Judas. It was a common name, but it meant to praise and to give thanks. And it had its origins in the son of Jacob, and it was one of the 12 tribes. And rooted in the great culture of the nation of Israel, it occurs throughout the history of Israel as a name of honor. But Judas, with his betrayal of Christ, tainted the name. And its meaning thoroughly contradicted what he became. And though his name meant praise, nothing about Judas meant, said brought praise. Rather, his sinful heart caused his actions to fly in the face of his very name. And so rather than praising the Savior, Judas betrays him. His sin brought what had once been a badge of honor to a place of dishonor. And sin is like that. It brings dishonor where honor should be. Second factor we find about Judas that helps us understand sin's impact on people is that sin corrupted his potential. Now, his roots connected him to a sophisticated past, but sin cost him his future. Now, I'm going to put on the screen a letter for you that was written, a sort of a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. It's supposedly from the Jordan Management Consultants. And it's to Jesus, son of Joseph. Dear sir, Thank you for submitting the resumes for the 12 men that you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we not only ran the test through our computer, but also arranged for personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultants. The profiles of all tests are included, and you'll want to study them carefully. As part of our services for your guidance, we make some general comments it is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitudes for the type of enterprise that you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capabilities. So he goes on to say in the letter, Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to the fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interests above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude which could tend to undermine morale. We feel it our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's the man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. Now, that brings a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of point about Judas. Judas had all the potential that you could possibly hope for in a disciple. Now, his name, Judas Iscariot, comes from two Hebrew words, one of which is ish and karioth. And ish means man, karioth means city. And so putting them together, we get the words man of the city. We gather that Judas likely came from a city by that name in southeast Judah, which is where he gets his name. So Judas came from the right side of the tracks. Judas was the only one of the 12 disciples who was from Judea. All the other 11 were from Hickland in Galilee. Uh, they were all considered uneducated, unqualified for leadership. Judas is the only one who, in the world's eyes, had the potential to really lead the nation forward. 
And so the challenge here is that sin is like that. Judas came from the right side of the tracks, but he had grown up in the sophisticated portion of the nation. And compared to the other disciples, he had all the possible advantages one could want. But the advantage became lost in his sinful heart. And sin is like that. It robs us of our potential. Now the third fact about Judas that helps us understand sin's impact on people is that sin canceled the call of God. His call was no different than the call of the other 11, but it brought no change of heart. Jesus calls him as one of the disciples. He comes on board with the other 11 men and works and lives among them for three or three and a half years. Now, we're not given a record of his early belief, and he was called as an apostle just as the other 11 were. And ironically, his name appears last on all of the apostle lists in Scripture. Now, why was he called? Why would Jesus bring a man knowingly on board who was going to be the traitor? Well, he was called of God because it was ordained it should be so. Christ knew from the beginning that Judas would betray him. This was not a surprise to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to the upper room toward the end of his public ministry and say, oh, I'm really shocked. I didn't realize we had a traitor among us. He knew from the very start that Judas was going to be the betrayer. John 6, 64 says, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, uh, who they were, who did not believe and who would betray him. So from the very start of Christ's public ministry, he calls, uh, calls Judas onto the team, so to speak, knowing that he was going to be a traitor. He was called to fulfill scripture. John 13, 18 says, do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. It's a quote from, uh, a paraphrase really, from Psalm 41, 9. And at the end of his ministry, Jesus makes reference to the Old Testament prophetic fulfilling nature of the call of Judas. In John 17, in that high priestly prayer, as Jesus is in the garden praying that marvelous chapter of John 17, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. A Sunday school teacher was teaching a group of teenage boys on one Sunday about Christ's disciples and their abilities and their attributes and why Jesus might have chosen them. And toward the end of this lesson, a teenage boy who was particularly enthralled with the whole concept of calling, chosen by God, said, Teacher, why did Jesus choose Judas? To which the Sunday school teacher replied, Son, I don't know, but I have a harder question. Why did he choose me? You see, we have a habit of, of lifting up Judas as some of this, some, somebody like the, the Hitler of the period, and he's a bad sinner, and I'm not. The fact that Jesus Christ called us to salvation in itself is every bit as much an evidence of his grace as his calling of Judas. And so Judas heard the same appeal to follow Christ as the other disciples. He had the same opportunities to believe as they did, but he became a hardened sinner instead. And his sin opened the gate for Satan to use him. Sin is like that. It interferes with our usefulness for God. Now, fourthly, sin clouded Judas's conscience. He ignored what was right. Now, why did Judas betray Christ? The scripture tells us that he betrayed Christ because Satan had influenced his mind. Uh, he was a thief, which set the pace for his being bought. In the Sunday school class this morning, we were dealing with 2 Samuel and how little sins can become bigger sins, and bigger sins become huge sins. And that's exactly what's going on in Judas' life. Judas has been a thief all along. John 12, 6 said, he said he was concerned about the way they were exercising their fiscal responsibilities. And he said, not, he said this, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So he lived a life of thievery. He's the man carrying the, the, the money, if you will, for the disciples. And Jesus knows, of course, that he's dipping into the till on his own. And he betrayed Christ because Satan had entered into him. In John 13, Scripture says, after the piece of bread, this is at the upper room at the Last Supper, Satan entered him. And then Jesus said to him, what you do, do it quickly. Now, how did Jesus betray Christ? The betrayal was premeditated. It was not insanity. It was not passion. It was a premeditated effort. 
I wonder, wonder, some years ago, hearing an interview of a, a prosecuting attorney who was asked if he could explain why a particular criminal had carried out a certain heinous act. And he said, in all the years as an attorney, no criminal has ever said to me, this is why I did that, so that I could say, oh, I understand. He said, criminal behavior is always uh, a form of insanity, if you will. But in this case, uh, Judas is premeditating this. And in Matthew 26, when one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests, and he said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So the, the, the pray, betrayal of Christ here was an act of cowardice. He was afraid of the crowds. The, the, the Pharisees had been looking for a way to take Jesus Christ off the scene for quite a while. Judas knew that. Judas knew there was economic benefit to be had, and he knew that he could exact, uh, extract himself from being identified with this rabble-rousing person that the Pharisees wanted off the scene. He was afraid of the crowds. And he and his co-conspirators were driven by public opinion instead of righteousness. In Luke chapter 22, we read in verse 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. And then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And it was done brazenly, with, with impunity. He, he, after he actually receives the funds for the action, and he goes to the garden where Jesus has been praying, and Peter talks about that event. He goes back and looks at that in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 15, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He unnecessarily uses the kiss of peace to identify Christ to the others. We're familiar with the passage in Matthew 26 where the scripture says, Greetings, Rabbi, and he comes and he kisses Jesus. It was an act of peace. It was, an under, it was a greeting that, that brought, uh, it had similar things to the days of the, uh, the great medieval period when you, you lifted the visor to tell the oncoming soldier that you were uh, at peace with him. And he comes to Jesus and he gives him the understandable Jewish recognition of peace. And he gives Jesus Christ a kiss and uses that to betray him. And he demeaned Christ by, by selling him for a price of a slave. The scripture tells us that he received 30 pieces of silver. Exodus 21 says, If the ox gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. You see, this is not a matter of passion, not a matter of circumstances, not a matter of being drawn into something unawares. This was a premeditated action, and sin had clouded his conscience. Sin drove Judas into Satan's camp, and he met premeditated this horrible, unspeakable act, and, and he ignored all conscience and betrayed the Son of God with impunity. Sin is like that. It corrupts our conscience. Titus chapter 1, verse 15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But those who are defiled for an unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled we look around us in our world we live in today, and like me, you probably ask yourself, how can people do these things? How can this situation in our world seem today be as it is? And it's because sin has corrupted their conscience. But fifthly, sin concluded his life in infamy. His end suits his horrible deed. He tarnished his name. He's called, he called a curse from God upon himself. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 25, we read, Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. So the Old Testament clearly taught that this man, what he was about to do, would bring a curse on him. And he's never mentioned in Scripture, anywhere in Scripture, without the indictment, who betrayed him in some form. So you'll find the name of Judas throughout the Scripture. There are 40 verses of Scripture that mention the details of the betrayal, and all of them where Judas's name happens to be mentioned in the account, is, is, is added the words, who betrayed him. So the authors of Scripture did not want us to forget this man was a traitor, this man was a betrayer. And he came to a violent end. 
He became filled with remorse and committed suicide. Matthew 7 says he goes back to the, to the Pharisees and he said he gets this remorse. He realizes what he's done and realizes that he had done serious things. And so he goes to them in 27.4 and he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they say, what is that to us? You see to it. He threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Does the scripture teach us that Judas was unsaved? John 17, 12, in the great prayer that Christ is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And the word lost here is an interesting word because it means to be wasted. It means to be destroyed. And Christ uses the exact same phrase uh, as Paul does of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Judas went to a place where he belonged. The scripture refers to it as his own place. He was so suited for hell that the scripture calls it his own place. Acts 4, let's look at Acts chapter 1 together, if you would. Turn to Acts, to Acts chapter 1 with me. Acts chapter 1, and let's look together at uh, verse 24. Acts 1, 24 says, and they prayed and said, now this is when the disciples have decided that 11 is not a good number, and they decide they needed 12. And so they go out to get a 12th disciple, 12th apostle. And so they're praying for the Lord to give them insight as to who should replace Judas as one of the 12. And verse 24 says, And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. You consider the, the gravity of that statement. Here is Judas who has walked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years and at the end of his life after he has committed suicide and his ministry is being evaluated by those who stay, stay behind have characterized him as having gone to his own place, hell. Christ tells us in another passage in Matthew 26 that it had been better if Judas had never been born. That cannot be said of any believer because all believers are going to enjoy the marvelous presence of God in heaven for eternity. No Christian could, could not be said of any Christian that it would be better if he had never been born. And yet in Matthew 26, he said, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So sin concluded the life of Judas in, in, in infamy, and he died a death fitting to his horrible act. And he died in a fit of remorse and grief, and he found himself unable to do this terrible deed. And his soul perished, not because of what he did, because, but because he had never come to a saving faith with Jesus Christ. Sin is like that. It brings us infamy. Now, there are some vital reminders that I think we can extract from what we've seen in Judas's life. The first reminder is that external behavior is not a sure evidence of salvation. It's fascinating to me that the other disciples sitting in the upper room toward the end of Jesus' ministry, after they have shared together uh, one on, uh, uh, over all kinds of circumstances for three, three and a half years, none of the disciples were sitting there saying, when, after Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, none of the disciples said, you know, I'll bet it's that guy Judas. He, he's, he's never been quite with us. That didn't happen. In fact, all of the disciples were afraid that it was them. And so Judas has been living among them for three and a half years, and he practiced the miraculous shoulder to shoulder with the other apostles, but he was lost. And Jesus made it clear that even the performance of miracles is no guarantee of genuine salvation. Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we need to remember that external behavior is not sure evidence of salvation. The only person in this room that knows that you are a truly born-again believer, genuinely speaking, is you. And God. And we can all put on the face. We can all live in the midst of born-again believers and fit in just perfectly and all the time be lost. 
Secondly, we should not be surprised when ungenerate, unregenerate people surface in the church. Judas goes undetected to the end. He sat with them, ate with them, moved around with them, went from place to place, did miracles and all those things, and none of the other disciples said, you know, that's probably Judas. Thirdly, we should remember that hidden sins grow into larger ones. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's a Southern Gospel Quartet song uh, which uh, has been sung by a number of different groups. But the words are, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, slowly but wholly taking control. Sin will leave you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you far more than you want to pay. Secondly, we need to recognize that the human heart is hardened by sin. We, we need to remember that these, these, these sins that are under the surface begin to erode our heart. Hebrews 3.12 says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Are we aware as believers that until we actually enter heaven with Jesus Christ, we are still sinners. And sin is still deceitful. And our hearts can deceive us. Fourthly, we cannot serve two masters. Judas fell prey to the love of money, which is the root of all evil, says Scripture. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which have some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We live in a world where there are a lot of masters that call for us. There are a lot of masters. Maybe one of the masters is your employment. Maybe another master is uh, something else that you enjoy doing, an exercise or a, 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 a hobby that draws you away and becomes your master. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So Judas stands as the all-time worst example of how sin impacts people. And his name, his upbringing, his association with Christ proved worthless because of his sinful heart. And his deed of betrayal and his horrible end punctuate a life of failure, a life filled with the ultimate remorse and eternal loss. My challenge to us as a church and individuals as, as a body is let us not treat sin lightly. It can confirm us in our lost condition if we're unsaved, and if we've trusted Christ, it renders us useless to Christ and brings infamy to his name. I'm convinced that one of the reasons that the New Testament church is powerless in a lot of ways is because we've become soft about sin. Not necessarily us as a congregation, but us as individuals. As we begin to accept things that we never thought we would have accepted just a few years ago. I told my Sunday school class this morning, it's like the little old lady who says, Dear God, please forgive me. I do so many things I used to think were sin. And that's true in our lives, isn't it? Because we, like the turtle, like the, the frog in the, in, the, in the kettle, as the water is turned up and the frog is a, being a cold-blooded creature, doesn't recognize that he's about to be boiled to death. And we gradually become to, we come to accept things in our lives and accept attitudes and accept entertainment, and accept places we go, accept the things we see, the things that we, we go and do and support. And we don't even think about the fact that gradually and gradually we're being conformed to the world in which we live. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Don't allow your deceitful heart to keep you from him. The Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price, and his mercy and grace can be ours if we simply, by faith, believe in him. So the question I have for us who are believers, what hidden sin needs confession that will protect you from sinking deeper and deeper into sin. Don't allow your deceitful heart or embarrassment to make you useless to Christ. 
What we need in this age, especially in the world in which we're living and all the things that are swirling around us, both in our country and in our world at large, we need born-again believers who, as Pastor David likes to say, who are close and clean, who have confessed their sin, who have not allowed the little sins that nobody knows about to percolate underneath and eventually come percolating to the top and cause us to fall into heinous sin. One author a number of years ago speaking about men in ministry who fall into sin. He said, men in ministry, typically when they fall into sin that's visible, mean they have not fallen very far. And what he meant by that was that little sins underneath had been eating away at, his, at their heart. And gradually they had become deceived and then eventually the sin becomes visible and heinous. What have you done with the sin in your life? Have you brought yourself to recognize that Jesus Christ expects us to come, as 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sins, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The world in which we live would like for us to be mostly like them. Jesus says, I want you to be like me. I don't know what your experience with your children is, but we often, in our family, and you know some of our family, uh, often in our family, we say, why, why do they do that annoying thing? And then we discover that, hmm, I do that. They learned it from me. Or they learned, well, mostly they learned from my wife. But, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, they, they, learned, they learned it from us. They learned from the previous generation. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about the fact that David uh, commits this horrible sin with Bathsheba. And his son turns around uh, and, and does the same exact thing. He'd seen it modeled in his father. Jesus Christ wants us to be modeled after him, not after those around us. He doesn't want us to accept the, the lowest, lowest possible denominator. He wants us to raise the bar high and say, I'm going to be like Jesus Christ. I'm going to confess my sin. I'm not going to let embarrassment keep me away from it. I'm not going to, I'm going to be useful for God. We need in our churches in America men and women who are close and clean and are useful for God because they've confessed their sin. Scripture is very clear that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And so we made, need to make the resolution in our own hearts as a basis of looking at Judas's life that confession has got to become a high priority in our experience. Would you pray with me? Father, we're mindful that you expect us to look like you. Lord, so many of us, we compare ourselves to each other and the scripture says that's not a wise endeavor. Judas looked around at the other 11 disciples and he participated with all the things that the other disciples were doing. He looked like a, he looked like a believer. And yet, Father, deep inside, he had never trusted you as Savior and finds himself going to his own place, which the scripture calls perdition. And then, Lord, those of us who know you as Savior... How easy it is to let little sins, little things that don't seem to matter, little things that nobody knows about, to allow them to fester and to erode our hearts is dangerous because our hearts are deceitful and we begin to use, lose our usefulness for you. Father, help us to confess our sins and be useful to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Those of you joining us on live stream, we thank you for being with us this evening. Trust that uh, you'll be with us uh, Wednesday night at 6.30 for the prayer service. Now, for those of us in the room, I'm going to be down front, Pastor David, uh, what's your name again? Uh, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Kevin's going to uh, be at the piano.